attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone and welcome to tonight's webinar, Molecular and Genetic Tumor Testing and Why That's So Important. Just a couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. My name is Kim Ryan. I am Director of Patient Information Services for Fight Colorectal Cancer and I will be your moderator tonight. I will introduce our speaker to you, um, Dr. Tanios Bakai Saab here in just a second. Um, we do archive all of our webinars, so if there's something that you missed on tonight's webinar and you want to go back and, and listen into it again, we'll have our webinar within, uh, up on our website within about 24 to 48 hours, so look for it there. Uh, there will be a survey that comes out to you following the webinar this evening, and if you could just take a moment and, and fill that out, we do appreciate all of your feedback, and then we'll send you out a, uh, a free Blue Star of Hope pin, too. So there's a couple of ways you can ask questions tonight. If you want to use your panel on the right hand side of your screen, you can type a question in there. I can tell you that we already have several questions that came into us um, even before tonight's webinar, so we'll try and get to everyone's questions tonight. And um, if you'd rather not ask a question on tonight's webinar, you can feel free and call the Fight Colorectal Cancer Answer Line at the number listed there. So our disclaimer really in that the information and services provided by Fight Colorectal Cancer are just for your general information purposes only. And we do have a monthly patient webinar series, which is part of tonight's webinar. Um, that, that's what part of tonight's webinar is. And we try and have them on the third Wednesday of every month. Um, they vary in time. Sometimes they're from 3 to 4 in the afternoon, and sometimes they're from 8 to 9 in the evenings. Um, and the next one that we have coming up is going to be in September, and that is going to be about pathways and targets and how those things can actually affect treatment decisions. And then in October, we're going to have one about peripheral neuropathy, and uh, will it ever go away if you have it, and um, the problems that it can cause, the causes um, for it, and then the solutions um, to, to help folks feel better. So it is my pleasure to present to you tonight our speaker, um, Dr. Tanios Bakai Saab. Um, he is the Section Chief of the Gastrointestinal Oncology Program at Ohio State University Medical Center, and he has been a faculty member there since uh, 2009. Uh, Dr. Bakai uh, Saab's research focuses in the area of experimental and translational therapeutics with an emphasis on drug development kind of as it applies to gastrointestinal malignancies. Uh, he has been actively involved um, with multiple basic and translational science laboratories at Ohio State University, and one of his major points of interest includes integrating correlates as determinants of response and resistance in cancer therapeutics. So we're really thrilled to have him here with us tonight, and uh, Dr. Bakai Saab, I will turn some things over to you so you can click through your own slides here. Thank you so much for, um, for joining us tonight, sir. Great. Uh, thank you, Kim. Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure uh, uh, to be on tonight uh, and talking about uh, an important uh, subject in, uh, in cancer in general, but of course uh, focused on colorectal cancer, is we're moving into that era of molecular and genetic tumor testing. And, and why is it important? And, and frankly, uh, we are seeing uh, the tip of the iceberg today, uh, and this is only going to get better and better refined in the next few years. So we are in the midst of a, of a genetic and molecular revolution, if I may say. Uh, so we have, a, we have hopefully 30 to 40 minutes uh, over the slides. Some of these slides may look a little bit complicated, but we'll certainly go through them and, and try to uh, understand a little bit about the world of colon cancer today, especially relating to molecular and genetic testing. As you know, colorectal cancer is, of course, one of the most common and most lethal cancers in, in the United States, but it's also a worldwide health problem. Uh, it, it affects hundreds of thousands of lives worldwide every year. So if we uh, think about the origins of uh, colon cancer, we think about 60% uh, of colon cancers are actually sporadic, meaning they occur for no obvious reasons. Well, if you look at the dotted lines here, I mean, we, we do think that many of these sporadic cancers are actually somewhat hereditary. Now, now you have to think about uh, the, the, the world today, which is much different than the world uh, 50 years ago. 
Uh, we have smaller families. Uh, uh, we have less cousins, less uh, siblings. Uh, so we, it's less and less likely that just a, a simple history uh, will lead us to, to, to suspect the hereditary cancer. And this is why it becomes more and more important for us to actually do testing, and more and more is, is being done. As you know, Ohio State has pioneered some of the testing for Lynch syndrome across populations, and we have uh, published a major paper in New Journal of Medicine a few years ago that suggests that uh, everyone should be screened for Lynch syndrome because it's probably more prevalent than we think it is. But if we look at the familial and hereditary cases, 40%, and we suspect probably more than that, but at least 40% we think are related to familial and hereditary, and the most common with hereditary is Lynch syndrome. Uh, now, there are, uh, oops. Uh, there are others, uh, uh, of course, that we know of uh, that are less common, including the FAP, uh, Perth-Jager syndrome, and others. Uh, but the point is, is mostly that uh, a large number of patients with this type of cancer are actually or have familiar or hereditary reasons, and uh, uh, about 60% and perhaps less actually have sporadic meaning uh, that one that cannot link to a hereditary or a genetic or a familial case. Uh, when we look at the stage of distribution and diagnosis for colorectal cancer, actually about 20% only will present with stage 4. Most of the patients will present with earlier stages of the cancer. About 40% will present with what we call localized, meaning that it's localized to the colon but not involving the lymph nodes. And then 37% are involving the lymph nodes. Now, unfortunately, even though those are diagnosed early, stage 2s and stage 3s, localized and regional, uh, uh, about 30% of those patients eventually will have metastatic disease at some point. So about 40% of all patients with colon cancer will have metastatic disease at some point of their lifetime. So let's uh, move on now and, and to understand, to make the case, why is it important today and tomorrow uh, to actually find a way uh, to, uh, uh, to molecularly or genetically deciding, other than the genetics origin of the cancer, but also decide genetically within the tumor what tumors are likely to be cured by surgery alone, by the addition of chemotherapy, or by neither. So if you look at that graph, so we have about, for all patients who go, stage 3 are the patients with the regional lymph nodes, so lymph nodes attached to the colon that are involved with the cancer. So for 100%, so for 100 patient, patients that actually get surgery, because that's the, the intent of the surgery is to cure those patients, we actually cure 60% with surgery alone, we estimate. And about 20% will be cured by chemotherapy, in this case, adding 5-FU, fluoropyrimidine, and oxaliplatin. And then actually 20% of the patients will not benefit from chemotherapy and, frankly, will not benefit from surgery. Today, we don't have any uh, test that actually tells us, well, I'll show you, there is one that may actually give us a hint, but we don't have an accurate way to tell who's going to benefit from surgery alone and will never need chemotherapy. Now, we know chemotherapy has its toxicities. One of your webinars in the next couple of months actually is going to focus on, uh, on, the, uh, 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 on the neurotoxicity and, and whether it goes away or stays caused by oxaliplatin. So we understand that chemotherapy on the long run can have its toxicities. So how can we spare 60% of the patients the toxicity of chemo and the benefit of surgery alone? And how can we focus on those 20% where we need the chemotherapy, and how can we identify those 20%? And then also there's this other 20% that doesn't seem to benefit from anything we do um, in terms of surgery and that chemotherapy, and perhaps would be best served with no surgery or perhaps with no chemotherapy or both, or finding other alternatives for those patients. So how can we actually do that? And this is where we're drive, driving all this, all this trying to understand the genetic uh, origins of the cancer and how they respond to chemo, how they respond to surgery, why do some cancers recur, why some don't, why some do uh, benefit from chemo, and why others don't. As for stage 2, it becomes even more murky. Stage 2 colon cancer is, is uh, for many f clinicians, practicing clinicians, can be quite confusing, which of course, you know, uh, may end up uh, having, uh, having to do a hard choice one way or the other, which, of course, you know, involves the patients in that decision. 
uh, of whether to get treatment or not. Stage 2 colon cancer is divided between low risk and high risk. Most of them are low risk and will never benefit from chemo and they should not get chemotherapy. Some actually are considered high risk, meaning they have a very high risk of having the cancer coming back. But let's talk about that one second. The, f the fact that you may have a cancer that has a high likelihood of coming back doesn't necessarily mean that that cancer is going to benefit from the, ke from the chemotherapy. Meaning that if we have a patient who goes to surgery and then the surgery uh, provided a cure or the potential for a cure, then the question that follows, should we treat with chemotherapy or should we not? And uh, the answer is, uh, has been actually tried to, to be answered through multiple studies that as of today have not clearly answered the question in stage two. Stage three, we have a clear answer that adjuvant therapy, at least for the general population of stage three helps. For stage two, we're trying to pick those that are more likely to, to, uh, to respond. So we have the old way to do it, which is still consistent with what we do today. And that's just looking at the clinical pathologic features, meaning was this tumor large enough to shut down completely the colon? Did it break through uh, the bowel wall or the perforation? So these are T4 tumors. Did we harvest less than 10 or 12 lymph nodes? This would be suboptimal harvesting of lymph nodes. And so the surgeon's, surgeon ends up with less lymph nodes than we'd like, uh, or the pathologist doesn't look at enough lymph nodes. And what happens is that we'll have to give the patient the benefit of the data and we'll treat them as a stage three. Uh, because even one lymph node that's positive would classify as stage three. And if you don't have what we think less than more than 12 lymph nodes harvested along with the tumor, we will have difficulties doing an accurate staging and it's better to actually uh, put uh, 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 that on the side of the patient and make sure we treat it uh, with the potential benefit that stage 3 is may and patients will get chemo. Now, two criteria that are very controversial are those lymphatic or vascular invasion and poorly differentiated histology. We still use them. They're in guidelines, but some data suggests that they might not be relevant. Then something I'm going to talk about a little bit is uh, molecular biomarkers, microsatellite instability. And these are uh, proteins that are deficient, essentially, uh, and we think that they may be a predictive marker for no benefits from 5-FU. Uh, that's from uh, in the adjuvant setting for stage 2 columns, and this is from uh, uh, looking back at one of the larger studies. Of course, the problem with the study is it was looking back and not, not, not forward, and there are studies today that are looking forward, but it does give us a hint that there may be a, a molecular biomarker within the cancer cell, uh, that MSI, that actually suggests that patients may not benefit from chemotherapy. And, and what is microsatellite instability? Because you probably hear a lot about it. Uh, so there are um, proteins that we call MMR, mismatch repair, MLH1, MSH2, MSH6, and PMS2. And when there are defects in MMR, that well, qualified this as MSI, a microsatellite instability. And there are two ways to look at MSI in the tumor. Either you genotype, you look at the genetic uh, mut and the mutations, and that's MSI high ver versus MSS stable or MSI low. Another way to do it is uh, uh, cheaper and quicker, an IHC, which we do actually quite routinely at Ohio State for all our patients, regardless of the stage, frankly. Uh, mostly uh, as a part of Lynch syndrome screening, and I'll, I'll we'll talk quickly about that at the end of the slide, uh, but looking at deficient versus profesh, proficient MMR. And uh, MSI tumors, uh, as I said, are due to either germline mutations of the proteins, and that's in Lynch syndrome 5%, so this is one way to, to uh, raise a red flag about uh, this uh, familial or, or inherited disorder, or sporadic hypermethylation genes. And, Lynch syndrome screening, what you do is you look either at IHC or MMR proteins, and if there are missing, uh, then we check for BRAF mutations. And if BRAF, uh, we'll talk a little bit about that later, if BRAF is wild type, meaning non-mutated, which is about 90% of those tumors, if not 95%, then you actually do genetic te testing for Lynch syndrome. So that's one way where you can use the tumor uh, to, one, we think, some of that may help you decide on chemotherapy or not in high-risk patients. Uh, but two, it also can lead the way to help you diagnose Lynch syndrome 
uh, in, in, in some patients. So as I said, uh, uh, the risk of recurrence is something you hear about a lot. Uh, it, there are ways to calculate the risk, the risk of recurrence, regardless of the stage two or three. There's adjuvant online, uh, which is through the Mayo Clinic. It essentially looks at uh, six uh, things, age, comorbidity, meaning you know, if there are any other illnesses, how deep the tumor is, uh, the number of lymph nodes that are positive on those examines and tumor grade. A very rough way to actually look at the risk of recurrence and it tells you how likely the cancer is going to recur. Uh, remember, as I said, the risk of recurrence itself is not necessarily a justification of giving chemotherapy. There is not a necessary link between the two. That's one of the problems of Oncotype DX, for example. It's a test that you may have heard about. Uh, that some docs do in their clinics. It's done commonly in breast cancer, and in breast cancer, unlike with colon cancer, it has been linked directly uh, to, uh, to, uh, to justifying benefits from chemotherapy. Unfortunately, in colon cancer today, it only tells you about uh, whether your cancer is a high risk of recurrence or not, but it does not actually help us decide whether someone should get chemotherapy or not. I mean, giving chemotherapy is a big decision, especially in a stage two patient, because again, the relative toxicities are there and we have to be careful and we don't want to subject patients, and patients don't want to subject themselves to actually having uh, a, a toxicity that may be unnecessary. This is going to be refined. It's only going to be a matter of time where we're going to be able to actually tell who exactly will need chemotherapy. Right now, I think it's a, it's a useful guide as long as the patient and the physician have a discussion at length about the benefits and the risks of actually having such a test, especially on stage two cancers. There's another one called Coloprint, again, similar but not as well established. So just to quickly look at the Oncotype DX uh, test, which is a recurrence score that predicts, as I said, the recurrence risk in stage two. There's one for stage three we'll, we'll take a look at in the next slide, but in stage two, uh, essentially, and as you see here, this, you look at the middle uh, middle curve, and that tells you the risk. And these, the dashed uh, ones are the confidence intervals, meaning the variations. <coughs> Excuse me. But as you see, as the score goes up, uh, as the score goes up this way, the likelihood of recurrence goes up as well. The score of 40, for example, tells you that there is a uh, close to 15%, uh, maybe 13, 14% uh, recurrence rate. A score of 60, uh, for example, uh, will tell you that there is more than 20% chance, 23, 24% chance of the cancer coming back. Again, the problem with this particular test for stage two is that it only helps you, um, uh, it only helps you with, with telling or understanding the risk of recurrence. Unfortunately, it doesn't help as much yet uh, in telling us who may benefit from chemo and who not. As you recall with the previous slide, that's one of the dilemmas we have and that's what we're trying and continue to try to understand. Now, I think something I'm a little bit more excited about is uh, actually this analysis, looking at the recurrence score uh, in stage three colon cancer. So this was actually from stage two, stage three colon cancer in a study called NSABPC07. That study was a, a US-based study through NSABP that looks, looked at 5-FU and oxaliplatin uh, versus 5-FU. 5-FU was given as a bolus, uh, so not the full FOX, you know, but what we call FLOX. So bolus 5-FU and oxaliplatin. And what's interesting is, and I really want to focus on stage 3A and B, because stage 3C, there's no doubt uh, in my mind that, uh, it, and it's very difficult to justify not giving patients 5 uh, and oxaliplatin today. Stage two, uh, more and more data is rising that we shouldn't probably, for the overwhelming majority of the patients, apply oxaliplatin and should stick to 5 few for the high-risk patients. But stage 3A and B is actually where sometimes, especially stage 3A, we have a dilemma. Uh, a patient may be reluctant to receive oxaliplatin because of the risks of neurotoxicity, but of course, it, it, because a lot of these studies have not separated A, B, and C, it was a little, it is a little difficult in the clinic to discuss whether we should withhold oxaliplatin or not in a curative setting. Uh, so what this test may help 
uh, us to understand, especially it seems to be most powerful with that stage 3 A and B, is that it may tell us uh, that certain patients may not benefit as much from oxaliplatin. And so again, this, is a, this has to be a, a discussion uh, between the physician and the patient. Now, let's say in my own clinic, what I would do, I always would favor for all stage threes to use oxaliplatin and 5-FU. However, I have to sit and discuss with the patient, and I do, about you know the relative, especially in stage 3A and B, the relative risks and benefits of oxaliplatin. In stage 3C, it's, it's much less of a discussion. Uh, I mean, the discussion is still there, but it's, it's much less uh, problematic. In stage 3A, uh, when very few patients where this discussion may culminate in actually ordering the test, and the test may help guide the patient or guide us to actually just proceed with 5 of you only. Today, it's probably a minority of cases. I foresee that in the next few years as this test and others like the Colprin gets refined, that we're going to be able to tell every patient whether they're going to benefit from chemo or not, whether they're going to benefit from oxaliplatin or not. Uh, so this is, as I said, the tip of the iceberg. We're starting to see clearly that there are ways for us, or more clearly, that there are ways for us to actually distinguish who may and who may not benefit. We're not there yet. We're getting close, and I think we're getting really close, and that day is going to come soon. So, you know, if we want to summarize all this, let's look at stage 2s and stage 3s. So for stage 2 colon cancer, we have to look at high-risk features. And like I said, microsatellite instability status may help us decide whether to offer adjuvant therapy. For stage 3 colon cancer, we have to offer Folfox for stage 3C. And for stage 3A and B, you could argue for some patients you may just stick to 5 f or Folfox. And we know today that for the elderly patients, we may not even need oxaliplatin in any case, and 5 f or Zoloda alone uh, may actually be the only thing that we need to offer as they offer the benefit without the toxicity of oxaliplatin. And of course, for stage 2, 3 rectal cancer, it's a little different uh, where we add usually radiation and it's a different discussion. Uh, but overall principle is about the same. Now moving to stage 4 colorectal cancer or metastatic colorectal cancer, and this is where we now have a lot of agents available to us and a lot of uh, uh, things are happening uh, that are slowly but surely helping us decide what biologic agents and for whom should we give them. Now, since, uh, uh, since at least for the last decade, uh, if not less, we've had a, a, number, a number of agents uh, being added to our armamentarium in treating this cancer. 5-FU uh, was the first drug that actually we used for about four decades. I mean, we started using this agent in uh, 1962. It was discovered in 1957. And we had nothing but 5-FU until the 90s where we had irino and added. And then since then, we had uh, three additional chemotherapy agents, capecitabine, which is the oral form of 5-FU, or kind of, uh, you know, it, its end product is very similar. Uh, its toxicities are certainly a little different, uh, but it seems to be very similar in terms of its activity. And then irino and oxaliplatin. And then uh, between 2004 and 2006, we had one inhibitor of blood vessel formation around the tumors, bevacizumab, and then two what we call EGFR inhibitors targeting the cancer cell itself, cetuximab and penetumumab. And then more recently, we had a flibercept, which is similar to bevacizumab in terms of its target, meaning angiogenesis, blood vessel formation, although it does it a little differently. I'll show that in the next slide. And then rigorafenib, which is the first oral uh, targeted agents, and the second oral agent in metastatic colorectal cancer, uh, and that's approved as a single agent in more refractory cancer. So we have a lot of other different agents now approved for colon cancer, thankfully, and we're learning more and more about what makes a difference and how should we place them and how should we sequence them. And we know that the more we are able to expose patients to all three drugs, this is talking about chemotherapy drugs, the higher the likelihood of surviving the cancer. As I said, a lot of these interesting agents that have been coming along over the last few years are those what we call uh, MABs, or monoclonal antibodies. Uh, so we have the Ximabs, the Zumabs, and the Mumabs. Uh, the Ximabs, or Cetuximab, 
is essentially uh, an agent commercially known as Herbitux, and it's actually uh, an agent that targets EGFR, uh, the epidermal growth factor receptor. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And uh, the, the, the other agent that does the same is penetumumab, uh, or known commercially as Vectivix. Uh, and those two agents uh, target the same receptor. Uh, the Tuximab uh, is a little different. Uh, the yellow stuff here is actually uh, the mouse component, and the orange stuff is the human component. The penetumumab is 100% human. So the MUMAB is 100% human. The XEMAB is about uh, 60 to 70% human. And then you have the ZUMAB, and the, the agent that belongs to that is Bevacizumab, which essentially targets the blood vessels around the tumor, uh, or commercially known as Avastin. And Bevacizumab is about 90 to 90, actually it's 93% uh, 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 human, and then 7% uh, uh, murine or mouse. So first and foremost, let me talk a little bit about the EGFR inhibitors because in the world of metastatic colorectal cancer, these are probably the most interesting because we actually are now understanding more and more how to select uh, those patients who are more likely to benefit from them, meaning essentially this is really where we need to go is trying to test the tumor to see if we can actually get the most benefit from an agent that's expensive and has the potential for toxicities and spare patients who will not benefit from it, both the toxicity and, of course, uh, the cost. And most importantly is try to find other alternative for those patients who are not going to respond to this agent. Uh, so uh, for uh, these receptors called EGFR or epidermal growth factor receptor, they drive the cancer cell to do a lot of things. They drive the cancer cell to actually become immortal. Uh, they drive it to multiply, and they also indirectly drive some of the blood vessels around the tumor. Now, uh, the, what happens is that you get two receptors coming together, and that actually sends a signal down, downstream to the nucleus. That's the nucleus, the core. So this is the command center. The nucleus is like the command center. It, it's the, the center that gives all these orders to the cancer cell to do the stuff it does. But uh, in order for uh, the uh, receptor to actually send the signal, it doesn't go as a straight line, but it goes, it's almost like the Pony Express. It goes through multiple stations. In this situation here, RAS, RAF, MEC, MAP, K. That horse has to take a break between stations because, before it relays the message all the way uh, to the nucleus. And so uh, uh, you can block the receptor. Uh, so what happens is a ligand actually uh, comes, a ligand is essentially a protein that circulates and goes and binds to one of the receptors. When it binds to one of the receptors, it brings another in and then activates the receptor, which sends the signal downstream. And so this uh, uh, red-shaped uh, uh, piece is actually uh, uh, an antibody, which is essentially uh, a monoclonal antibody that uh, targets uh, the ligand, preventing the activation of the receptor, and that's what cetuximab uh, and penetumumab do. And when they do that, they essentially prevent the signal uh, from happening. And so when you prevent the signal from happening, then you don't have that signal going to the command center, and the cancer cell will either wither and die or will uh, stop uh, progressing. Now, what happens if you have a mutation in KRAS? Now, you hear a lot about that. Your tumor was tested for KRAS, and, you, and, and that protein KRAS is, is mutated. And what does that mean? If it's mutated, that means it actually is activated on its own regardless of what happens at the surface level. So whether the receptor gets activated or not, this protein doesn't care. It sends its signals all the time down to the nucleus, regardless of that receptor. So if you actually now want to try to block that signal from happening at the surface, that RAS protein that's mutated doesn't care. You can block it all what you want. It's still going to send its signal downstream. And this is, was the first discovery that KRAS mutations in the colorectal cancer cell will not respond to EGFR inhibitors, which was very interesting. That was the first time in colon cancer that we had something that tells us that an agent will not work. So this was exciting, um, and we, we, what we looked is at codon, and again, I mean, you know, the, 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 
the genetic material, the DNA, had multiple exon pieces to it. And so we looked at one piece of it, exon 2, and codons 12 and 13, which are the ones, uh, so small pieces of, of that, of that, uh, of that exon that actually uh, have, have the mutation. And we understood that mutations in those two codons are actually uh, driving the SCARES mutation, and those patients should not, should be excluded from receiving EGFR inhibitors because they will not benefit from them. Of course, the problem was that for, we found that this is in 40% of the patients, and 60% of the patients uh, uh, have no mutations. Uh, and when we give them the EGFR inhibitors, when they receive the EGFR inhibitors, like cetuximab and penetumumab, um, only 50 to 60% of them will respond. The others don't. So although we found which patients will not respond, we have yet to work harder on trying to actually identify better the patients who are more likely to respond. And I'll show you this is starting to happen. Um, now, moving to the VEGF inhibitors. So those are the inhibitors that actually block the blood vessel formation around the tumors. And the first one in, uh, in class that was approved in colon cancer was bevacizumab or avastin. And this is actually uh, 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 an antibody in blue here that blocks the ligand, meaning the, the, the protein that activates the receptor. So it blocks it before it gets to the receptor. And by that, shuts down uh, the process of blood vessel formation around the tumor. Remember, the tumor, like any other organ, it needs blood, it needs uh, oxygen and nutrients. And if you block that access, you're uh, hopefully or likely to cut down uh, the circulation around the tumor, and eventually the tumor will stop growing, hopefully wither and die. Another agent uh, that was just approved by the FDA is a flibercept, uh, which is a VEGF trap, and essentially the name is trap, meaning what it does, it's, it's like a magnet, it's a decoy receptor that circulates in the blood and attaches that itself to the ligand. And then one that you're going to hear more and more about is remucirumab, which is now uh, likely to be approved in gastric cancer, although I don't want to speculate, but I think the data is looking very positive. And it's actually a, a, a blo uh, blocks the receptor itself. So rather than actually acting on the protein that activates the receptor, this one blocks the receptor completely, and this is being looked at in colon cancer. And finally, an agent called regorafenib, uh, which is an oral multi-kinase inhibitor. And all what that means is that this is an agent that attacks multiple targets inside and outside the colon cancer cell. It attacks the blood vessels around the tumor, and it also attacks targets on the tumor that stops the tumor from growing. Uh, this was recently approved as a single agent in uh, colon cancers that have, not responded, uh, uh, that have not responded to other therapies or have progressed other therapies. So now we have all these agents. The problem is we don't have a way to select yet who will respond better to one versus the other and how to do the sequencing. We're learning more and more. The NCM guidelines are a great resource to help us see the trees in the forest, but I'll show you in the next couple of slides that the NCM guidelines are getting quite busy, quite busy and dizzying, to be frank. Uh, but they're still a great resource. A lot of clinicians and a lot of patients rely on them. Uh, when taking decisions about their treatment. Um, some uh, patients with stage 4 are still cured, by the way. Uh, so when we hear stage 4, colon cancer, stage 4, we still have some patients with colon cancer to the liver or to the lungs or, or limited disease that we can still cure uh, with a more aggressive approach. And we have three chemotherapy backbones. I'm not going to waste your time on them. You probably heard this multiple times, but they are all equivalent and they're all useful in the first line. They have a little bit different toxicities, need to be discussed with your oncologist. And then most patients tolerate a chemotherapy doublet, and these are those that were presented. But frankly, some patients may need just a single agent with a biologic. And we've seen that those biologics are improving outcome. I mean, we're talking about tripling the likelihood of survival uh, from colorectal cancer in the metastatic setting over the last few years only. And again, like I said, we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. As we refine better, as we get to this point where we individualize our therapy and we're finding more of these genetic and molecular predictive factors, once we get to this ultimate refining, we're going to be able to have our patients uh, survive this 
many, 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 many years, even with very metastatic disease. They're already doing that, but we want more and more of them uh, to reach that level. Uh, where we're going to be talking about a cure in the metastatic setting, not just with the early stages. And, and these are the NCCN guidelines. I'm not, of course, I'm not going to go through them, uh, but I'm just, just illustration of how many options we have. Like I said, it's getting quite busy and dizzying at times, but that is good. That is good. I remember a few years ago we would look at this and we had only one or two lines, and now we have two pages actually, just for one. Uh, uh, one setting for uh, the metastatic setting. So uh, this is good news for us. We are on the right track. We're learning more and more about uh, how to refine our treatments, but we're also having more and more options to choose from for our patients with colon cancer. So we're learning multiple things. One, if you have this non-mutated KRAS, uh, so the wild type, and those are eligible for EGFR inhibitors, uh, we know that in the first line, you can use either uh, the VEGF inhibitor, bevacizumab, or the EGFR inhibitors. They seem to be very equivalent. Uh, they have different toxicities. Um, bevacizumab and then this ziv uh, uh are actually competing for second line uh, with each other. They both uh, have data that suggests you can use them. Even when you fail bevacizumab in the first line, you can still be use bevacizumab in the second line, but you can also use this aflibercept. And in some instances where you care as wild type uh, and you haven't used EGFR monoclonal antibodies in the first line, you can use them in the second line. Uh, we don't know yet, as of today, how we should sequence. Should we start with a VEGF inhibitor or an EGFR inhibitor? At this point of time, overwhelmingly, we start with a VEGF inhibitor because of the more favorable toxicity profile and the equivalence. Uh, but more and more data is suggesting that as we refine better and better how we choose EGFR inhibitors, we may have a role for them in the first line. Regorafenib as a salvage therapy. Now, regorafenib uh, uh, has been now uh, established as a standard uh, in refractory setting for a few months, uh, but we are learning more and more. There are a lot of trials. Uh, I'm sorry, not trials. There are a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, work that's being done. Uh, to try to understand who are the patients who will respond to it. We don't have that answer yet, but a lot is being done, and I suspect we're going to have some in the next year or two to help us understand this further. There was recently a study that was uh, presented at ASCO widely and presented again in Europe that looked at the differences between an EGFR inhibitor, cetuximab, and a VEGF inhibitor, bevacizumab, uh, and both uh, looked very equivalent. The responses were the same. Uh, the progression-free survival was the same, meaning how long it takes the tumor to progress. And uh, the survival was actually surprisingly a little bit better with cetuximab versus bevacizumab. Uh, this was not the primary endpoint of the study, meaning the primary objective was to look at the response rate. So uh, it was actually an interesting finding that there may be a subgroup of patients, what that study is telling us, that may be more likely to benefit from cetuximab to bevacizumab. How do we do that from here on? I mean, we have these hints here and there, and we have some ways to look at the genetics of the tumor, but we haven't really and completely understood that yet. Well, let's go back uh, uh, to, to, uh, to this and understand a little bit more. What is driving uh, uh, the cancer cells to be resistant, resistant to anti-EGFR antibody? But we thought it was just codone 12 in the past. Uh, which is the most common, but we understood that codon 13 is also the uh, another one. So uh, when you look at, at a report from the mutated KRAS, codon 12 and 13 are the ones that stand out, but occasionally you see codon 61 and 146, and there are others. So a lot of these may be drivers of the, of, of the resistance. And then uh, we have BRAF, and BRAF, uh, again, you hear about it sometimes in the tumor, is another driver that's downstream of RAS, uh, so it's a, it's a station down uh, from RAS that relays the message to the core. Uh, but mutant BRAF has never been shown to actually affect the response rate to EGFR inhibitors. Instead, uh, it seems to be a bad prognostic marker. But then there are others like uh, P10 and RAS mutation, PI3, uh, PIK3CA mutations. We're learning a lot about all these. And what does that mean? To, what that means is that we're going to get, we are getting closer and closer to the point where 
we are going to include all these mutations, NRAS, DIK, 3CA, perhaps BRAF, the jury, frankly, is still out on the BRAF mutations. So you remember we said that 40% of the patients have mutations in KRAS 12 and 13. Those definitely will not benefit from EGFR inhibitors. What we're learning is that there are other mutations like NRAS and PIK 3CA and perhaps HRAS. And again, as I said, BRAF right now is not integrated into that. In the KRAS wild type group, so that group that has no mutation, there's another 10% of the patients, 10 to 15%, that we could include with what we call all RAS mutants. And what that ends up doing for us uh, is essentially uh, uh, getting us to the point where by integrating all these mutations together, and again, I'm not going to go through the details of all this on this graph, on this table, but all, this, all what this will tell us is that uh, we will have the capability uh, to more and more zoom in on what pro proportion of the patient population will be able to respond better uh, to the treatment and what percent of patients or what individual patients should not get the treatment. So today, we look at just codon uh, uh, 12 and 13, which is about 40%. Uh, this study was actually presented at ASCO and was very interesting. This is a study of looking at full FOX chemotherapy versus full FOX plus penetimumab. And what they looked at is actually uh, uh, adding the other KRAS mutations, so exon 3 and codon 61, that's 4%, then exon 4, 117, and 146, that's 6%, then uh, NRAS, exon 2 and 3, that's another 7%. So added to the 40%, now we think that there is another 17% of the patients that are unlikely or less likely to respond to EGFR inhibitors, so more than close to 60% now. So we went from 40% 34 years ago, where we had that certainty, now to close to 60%, where we're getting to close certainty that those patients will not respond to EGFR inhibitors. So this is where this is going. And if we look at these slides here, and again, uh, 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 the slides uh, on this side, on your left side, Looking at just uh, the, the KRAS wild type, the traditional ones that, that we've been testing for the last three years, there is a survival benefit, but you can see that this widens significantly when you actually include those other 17% of the patients uh, and you, ex you exclude them from the analysis, then you have actually a much cleaner uh, uh, and patients seem to benefit much, much better. And it seems that those patients with these all rest mutations uh, not only that they may not do as well, but they may do worse by receiving the EGFR inhibitor. And this is another study that shows the same. This is the Piccolo study, and that's now published actually in the Lancet Oncology this, of, of this year. So we have multiple studies now suggesting that we should actually expand our RAS mutation panel. And finally, a quick word about DRAF mutations. As I said, these, as you can see here, are the next station to RAS. Um, now these do uh, confer a worse prognosis, meaning you know the tumors tend to be more aggressive. However, uh, however, we have learned now that uh, the patients who have BRAF mutations in the KRAS wild type group uh, still benefit from uh, the addition of EGFR inhibitors like cetuximab and penetumumab. And so, at this point of time, unlike the other RAS mutations that I have presented to with NRAS and HRAS those patients actually tend to respond to EGFR inhibitors. And this is just a list of all these potential predictive biomarkers that we are looking at. A lot of them are looking interesting. The one that's most established is KRAS, of course, the one you hear about the most. And RAS is looking actually to be part of that RAS mutation as well as the PIK3CA. All these mutations are going to be clumped together. BRAF is not at this point of time. Then we're going to look at other mechanisms of resistance such as HER2 nu, uh, you know, about 8% of the patients with colon cancer may overexpress HER2 nu as a resistance to EGFR inhibitors, and there's a number of others. So we're learning more and more, and as I said, this all will fall into a matrix in the next uh, perhaps two to three years where we're going to be able to individualize uh, for every patient uh, the treatment uh, with those biologics. Uh, so one of the most uh, important questions that keeps on arising is, well, I had my uh, tumor tested 
um, the primary uh, should also should should my doctor also test my uh, liver tumor now that I have a liver metastasis and the answer is no uh, because there's close to 100% concordance between the primaries and the metastasis meaning if you have a KRAS mutation in one you're likely to have a RAS mutation in the other one and there is no need for a rebiopsy of the other tumor so let's conclude here so we can take questions uh, I think that we have established that the efficacy of uh, uh, EGFR monoclonal antibodies in KRAS wild type is well established but I think we're getting to the point where we may test for all the RAS mutations uh, and, and that's about 60% of the patients who may not actually benefit from EGFR monoclonal antibodies which means the other 40% will benefit tremendously uh, from these agents. What, what does that tell us? Uh, we don't want to leave the other 60% uh, without treatment options. Uh, uh, absolutely not. What we are actively doing, we and others are doing is we're finding actually agents that target uh, proteins underneath RAS. So as we learn more, we understand that we need to, rather than go above RAS, now we go below RAS, like the, what we call the MEK inhibitors or BRAF inhibitors or others, uh, to shut down that signal down to the core. And so that will actually help us refine this better and actually be able to find more alternatives to patients who are not benefiting from, uh, from, this, uh, from this therapy. So uh, just you know, to reiterate, uh, so bevacizumab or EGFR antibodies can be added to chemotherapy in the first line. EGFR antibodies actually maintain uh, uh, their efficacy in later lines, so we have a lot of options. The one thing, out of everything we've we've had so far, uh, uh, there there is a lot of activity of EG with EGFR inhibitors and bevacizumab combined to chemotherapy, except it seems for cetuximab and oxaliplatin for some uh, reason that we yet have to understand. Other than that, cetuximab seems to synergize with uh, with uh, irinotecan based regimens quite quite well. Uh, so this is where we at. These are all the agents that have been added and you can see that this has been a very active decade with the addition of all these MABs, aflibercept, regorafenib, and then understanding the role of continuing uh, inhibiting angiogenesis beyond progression. So at this point uh, I, will, I will end this and I thank you and I think we'll open this for questions. Very good. Well, thank you so much, um, Dr. Bakai Saab. That was a lot of information, and I, I think that we're going to find that a lot of people go back and reference this webinar because there's a lot of really good information in there. And I, I guess one of the, we, we've got a lot of questions here, and I think um, the one I really want to start with is you talked a lot about KRAS and BRAF and RAS and MEC and a lot of these acronyms. Could you maybe give, give us an idea of, from a patient's perspective, like how you would suggest they go to their doctor? Should they be like, do I, I need to have KRAS tested or I need to have BRAF tested? How would you suggest that a patient kind of initial, um, initiates this conversation about um, having their tumor tested with their physician? Oh, that's, a, that's an excellent question, and I think that's a that has become such a relevant question, especially after this, this ASCO, with the slew of information that has been presented to us. Uh, I think it is mandatory now uh, to have KRAS tested for all tumors before any decisions are made about treatment. I think this is where the patients, uh, and, and a lot of physicians may, uh, you know, maybe uh, feeling the pressure to start the treatment immediately and not wait for a test, but I think it's very, very important to wait uh, for a test. And it doesn't take too long, actually. Within a week, you'll have the answer for the test. And I think patients should actually uh, take charge of going to their physicians and asking, does my tumor have a RAS mutation? Do I have a KRAS mutation or does the tumor have a no mutation? And in the absence of a mutation, uh, does that mean that I'm eligible for more options? And what are these options? Uh, do you think I'm a good candidate for an EGFR inhibitor like cetuximab or penitumumab in the first line rather than bevacizumab, which has been our standard? And talk about the risks uh, and benefits of, of, of either. So I think, yes, it's very important that patients get involved in requesting that, that tumor gets tested for KRAS. And frankly, uh, soon enough, I suspect that we're going to have to test not just for KRAS, but for NRAS and for HRAS and others, so all the RAS mutations, uh, to select even better the patients who are likely to benefit. Now, BRAF, 
is a different story. Bira is still problematic for us because we don't understand whether it helps us select or refine better our treatment. Right now, I'm reluctant uh, to test for BRAF in some instances. The only times that we test for BRAF is we have uh, a clinical trial that have a BRAF inhibitor. So we, 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 there are multiple agents today available that uh, target BRAF specifically, so uh, BRAF inhibitors. Uh, and those could be used uh, eventually down the line when patients do not respond to the first-line treatments. And then finally, the MEK inhibitors are very interesting. They're actually some of the most active agents as long as you know how to select the patients for them. Uh, and they're being tested uh, specifically in KRAS mutated uh, tumors. So meaning that if a patient has a tumor that has a, a mutation in KRAS, then uh, the options become more limited because we cannot use the EGFR inhibitors. And this actually uh, has created a path uh, for discovery of these MEK inhibitors and testing in clinical trial. And a number of them are ongoing. We have some at Ohio State, but there are others also in other practices or other universities. And that brings that whole point about why it's so important today to test for the RASME for KRAS and perhaps for the other RAS mutations, and in some instances for the BRAF mutations, I think the patients should certainly approach their physicians and ask if those were tested, and if they were not, then they should be tested. Okay, great. And, and kind of along those same lines, is there, is there genetic testing that can be or, or should be done um, on a patient that will tell them um, if, if they're likely to respond to drugs other than, for example, Vectabix or Herbitox, other than the EGFR inhibitors? Uh, so unfortunately, um, if I may uh, miss it today, it's, it, it, there, there are none that are valid or reliable. So unfortunately, you know, there was a lot of work that, that had been done around uh, ERCC1 and oxaliplatin, perhaps, and TOPO1 and irinotecan. Uh, but unfortunately, all these uh, proved to be uh, not as useful. The tests are out there, but I personally would think that since we don't have any reliable or valid data, and we should not actually use them, as I think if, if if we look at those tests today, they, they would not really exclude someone from receiving treatment, but they would tell you that perhaps you should sequence this way or the other way. The problem is that that has never been looked at in any large study or any prospective trial. Uh, and so therefore, you know, you run the risk of actually utilizing a test that's not valid uh, uh, to, to actually uh, deprive a patient from an opportunity of actually uh, treatment that may work. So that's for the chemotherapy. The other challenge has been with the VEGF inhibitors like Bevacizumab, Avastin, and Regorafenib today, and Aflibercep. We have no way to, to really understand today, to really, I should say, detect who may or who may not respond. Meaning that, uh, you know, we, when, we, uh, when we looked at multiple trials and tried to understand if there are any genetic uh, variations uh, in the tumors uh, in the blood vessels around the tumors. Uh, we also looked at circulating uh, factors that these agents uh, inhibit to try to see if uh, if we can actually determine who may and who may not respond. And so far today, uh, about you know six seven years after all these studies have been done, we have not been able to actually find a single uh, test that would help us. Uh, refine or detect who may or may not respond. That doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Uh, and that doesn't mean that more refining is not being done. So both are being done. Uh, a lot of the trials that are almost done with or done with, like CLGB80405, has a tremendous, tremendous amount of data in, uh, that's being looked at to try to further uh, uh, the refinement of these VEGF inhibitors and, and EGFR inhibitors. So although today it's not, it doesn't exist yet, uh, but I suspect that we're going to have that answer in the next two or three years. So, you know, to make the story short, other than KRAS testing and perhaps now the rest of the RAS and BRAF testing uh, to help us understand who should get the EGFR inhibitors, we do not have any reliable tests for any of the other agents we use in, in colorectal cancer. Okay, 
Okay, great. And, and you didn't, I don't think that you mentioned this tonight, but I, I want to ask the question of you. Do you see colon cancer patients benefiting from PDL1 um, antibodies in development? Uh, so I, you know, I think this is really, really early uh, uh, to, uh, to tell. Uh, you know, the, uh, the PDL1s, which are essentially the program cell death, one ligand, um, you know, which essentially targets a certain uh, protein uh, encoded in, a, in, a, in one of the genes, uh, is probably applicable to most, to most cancers. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, there is only very little evidence in early stages that there may be activity across different solid tumors. Uh, it seems to be most active right now in, in those uh, cancers that seem to be driven uh, pretty much by the uh, or very immune, immunologic cancers like renal cell and uh, melanoma. Uh, but I suspect that it will probably have applicability uh, on the long run, uh, you know, with other malignancies, and, and they're going to be tested. So right now I can't say that uh, colorectal cancer and PDL1 are going to be a match. What I would say is that it's promising enough that it should be looked at and uh, we won't have an answer for a while, unfortunately, though. Okay, so we'll, we'll keep an eye out. Um, let's see. So are there any new drugs being developed um, for colorectal cancer in kind of in conjunction with molecular testing? Uh, in conjunction with molecular testing today uh, with, in colon cancer, the only agents that are being looked at are, uh, you know, that closely are actually there are <clears throat> three uh, categories of drugs that are being looked at uh, along with testing. So the KRAS mutations and MEK inhibitors, uh, so KRAS and RAS, the BRAF mutations and BRAF inhibitors, uh, and uh, then the CMET, which is another protein that seems to be overexpressed in uh, in colon cancer, in about uh, eight ten percent, uh, so either amplified or expressed, and CMET inhibitors, and CMET inhibitors. There are a number of them that are being developed by multiple companies, and many of them are focusing on colorectal cancer, uh, and selecting patients specifically that express highly CMET, uh, and I think that may end up being one of the next most promising targets. Uh, and some of the most promising agents. The early data with the CMET inhibitors, some of it was presented at ASCO, looked very, very promising, uh, although, again, these are early, early stage development studies. So uh, I think uh, the next wave of studies that we're going to see in the next two years are going to be focusing on the role of CMET, MEK inhibitors and RAS mutated and the BRAF inhibitors. We're starting, as I said, to see early signs with all three that suggest that this, these may be a uh, uh, category of agents and mutations that will select specifically uh, or amplification of, uh, of, of protein like SEMA that will select specifically uh, for tumors who are more likely to respond to those agents. There are others as well, uh, but not as well developed. So overall, as you can see, that refinement is happening and we understand more and more the biology. The other, the other uh, protein of interest actually is HER2. Now, you may have heard about HER2 in breast cancer with the drug Herceptin. You may have heard about HER2 in gastric cancer and Herceptin as well, or Trastuzumab. Uh, it, it also, there was a, a key paper that was published in, uh, <coughs> in Science Translational Medicine, which is uh, a, a, a relatively impactful journal, uh, that actually suggested uh, which confirms, you know, a lot of the suspicion we've had in the past that HER2 and then HER3. So these are two other, remember EGFR is HER1. So the family of EGFR receptors includes HER1, which is what we call EGFR, then HER2 and HER3. It seems that in many patients who become resistant uh, to EGFR inhibitors, HER2 gets upregulated. And in at least the early model that they looked at, if you block that HER2, then patient, uh, then I'm sorry, tumor cancer cells become sensitive again uh, to uh, to HER1. So uh, uh, groups like ours and others are starting to think about uh, uh, looking at the dynamics of the cancer, meaning getting biopsies as patients get resistant uh, to one agent, 
and look if HER2 is upregulated and consider actually adding uh, a HER2 inhibitor like uh, Herceptin, of course, on a clinical trial. And so that's another way also to look at uh, these proteins uh, as they change, sometimes under the pressure of one agent or the other. Okay, and we have actually three or four questions here as it relates to cost of, um, of these tests and genetic testing in general. Are, are, are you aware, like does insurance cover um, the tests that you've mentioned tonight and, and, and w in your experience, um, what about genetic testing kind of being um, covered by insurance companies? Uh, so the, are we talking about the KRAS test? I think I think probably the questions that have come in, I think one of them has to do with the KRAS testing, um, but oh. others just kind of genetic testing in general. So the answer is mostly yes and sometimes no. That's why it's important to have the discussion before, you know, agreeing on all these tests. Now, KRAS testing is standard. It will be covered by insurance across the board. Uh, the testing of other RAS mutations and VRAF mutations uh, are becoming more and more acceptable and mutation uh, and uh, and insurances are pretty much understanding the fact that this is important uh, and, and frankly you know it's it's economical uh, it saves it saves money but at the same time it saves lives uh, which is more important to us but to insurance companies you know it also saves money and that makes a good case uh, and so KRAS testing or RAS testing and BRAF testing has has not been an issue uh, now, uh, MSI testing, so what, what we've talked about in the early stages, IHC is actually cheap, but it has to be done in a place that that do, does it all the time, you know, and like uh, centers like ours, Fox Chase, MD Anderson, other places, you know, uh, where pathologists do it all the time. And that's a simple test, actually, uh, but you have to have a trained eye to look at it, and it's frankly, you know, gets with the rest of the pathology. Uh, Oncotype DX and uh, coloprint is not covered at this point of time as far as I know. Uh, I may be wrong in some instances, but for the most it's not that we don't use it. I don't, I don't you know, I, it doesn't have as much validity yet. Uh, Oncotype DX, uh, Oncotype DX actually is, uh, is a hit and miss, uh, you know, but, but I, my understanding is that, you know, there are ways to get the other company to help cover for in some instances and what have you. The, the, main, the main thing though, the main thing I think before jumping into any test, the most important question, and this is why it's very important, uh, you know, for the patient to be armed with this power, is to have a discussion with the physician. If this is positive, how is it going to affect my treatment? If it's negative, how it's going to affect my treatment? Is it going to change? Is it going to change what we do? Uh, you know, so when we think about the Oncotac DDX as well, as for example, you know, uh, I have uh, some problems with it, as I said, and, and part of that is that it does not help me pick a treatment or not. What it tells me is that the cancer is more likely to come back. Now, that doesn't really change what treatment the patient will receive, and so to put the patient through the risk has to be justified, and this is where uh, you know, the discussion ensues. For KRAS, it's a different story. It changes a lot what you do. Uh, for MSI, it may actually help you uh, uh, help you refine further where you actually can screen someone for Lynch syndrome because it has implications on the family, but it also has implications on the patient because if you have Lynch, if you have Lynch syndrome, then you have to be also screened for other cancers such as bladder cancer, you know. Uh, 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 and also the other good news with Lynch syndrome is that they tend to do better overall. Uh, so, in, you know, good news and bad news. Uh, but overall, this is why a lot of these tests may or may not be covered uh, by insurance. Most importantly is that discussion with the doc about whether it's going to make a difference for the patient or not, not just having another test. Uh, now, CMET is only part of a clinical trial. It is not uh, looked at. Now, there are other tests. There are other genetic tests. Uh, uh, genomic test, I should say, like uh, uh, the, uh, the foundation medicine test and a number of other tests that actually look at a panel of genes. Uh, these are uh, uh, not covered by many insurances and covered by some, uh, but unfortunately they do not help much in terms of uh, helping refine the treatment. But what they may help is finding other mutations that may lead you to other clinical trials across the nation. Uh, so again, 
uh, to get to that level of refinement, uh, especially when you start to talk about, about non-standard of care options, uh, this should be discussed at length with the physicians to make a decision, a rational decision, about whether it's going to be worthwhile uh, to, uh, to do the test or not. Okay, uh, um, and you, you talked a little bit about um, recurrence um, in, in um, patients' cancers coming back. So what is the relationship exactly between, um, well, the relationship of, of having molecular testing done um, for recurrent disease, for recurrent metastatic disease? So is that something that you, said, that you recommend for patients? So that's, that's essentially what Oncotype DX tells you. It tells you that, you know, if you have a score, a higher score, you're, you're more, your cancer is more likely to recur. Now, I, I personally, in my clinic, I, I tend not to do it. And, and the main reason for that is because it doesn't provide me with, with help or the tools to change, uh, uh, you know, one way or the other, how I'm going to treat the patient. And it's not going to change how I follow up the patient because we follow the patients very closely anyways, regardless of. The way I see it is that, you know, in some instances, it may create anxieties, additional anxieties. And if I don't have a solution, uh, immediate solution to say, well, this is how I'm going to make sure that your recurrence rate is going to go down, uh, then I haven't helped the patient. And so until that test, those tests that test that actually look just at the likelihood of recurrence. Until these tests are linked to a solution, i.e., you will benefit from treatment X, I find a very hard time to actually recommend them for patients. Remember, Oncotep DX in breast cancer, for example, uh, which is very similar, it tells you that you're more likely to recur, but it also tells you that, and this is, uh, this is the treatment that you should receive. So you're more likely to benefit from treatment to cut down on the risk of recurrence. In colorectal cancer, it only tells you about the likelihood of recurrence, but it does not tell you whether treatment is going to change the outcome. So that, that is the main reason why I think uh, it may be difficult to actually justify, uh, you know, getting this test. Um, with the KRAS, in the more advanced setting, it's a different story because it tells you exactly who should not receive a certain drug. And so that has direct therapeutic implications. I hope that is making it somewhat clear. I know this is relatively complex, but is that, is that, is that helping a little bit in terms of... Yes, no, no. I yeah, no, I, I I think that it is, and you know we're we're getting other questions, and so so we'll we'll know. But so you're basically saying it's the, the same test in a different disease state can provide your physician different different pieces of information. Yes, yes. Okay. So so you can't you can't apply the same principles at different cancers. So if in okay. one cancer this test tells you your cancer is, is more likely to come back. No, no, more likely to come back doesn't mean it's a hundred percent. More likely means you know it's an extra ten percent likely that it may come back. But I don't have, the test doesn't tell me what to do about it. Uh, then you understand that this is a test that will just create anxieties but will not offer solutions. On the other hand, uh, it, the same test in breast cancer uh, helps you understand the risk of recurrence but also provides you with a solution. It tells you the treatment to actually uh, help uh, cut down the risk of recurrence. Then that anxiety is countered by the, the a solution. And so we are not there yet in colon cancer. Okay. Okay. At good. Least for this test. Okay. No, I think that, that I think that's clear. Um, let's see. So, what if um, a patient is is um, in a great place and is cancer free? Is genetic testing still important for a patient like that? And, and I, I'm assuming we're talking about the genetic testing as it pertains to the tumor itself or to the in inherited or familial forms of cancers? Well, maybe you could address both of those things because it might be, that might be a, a good clarification. Okay. So uh, as it pertains to familial and, uh, and, uh, and inherited types of cancers, I think uh, uh, depending. So for Lynch syndrome, we have a very clear path. Um, we have a very clear path, uh, you know, at least institutions like ours, and I know Fox Chase, and I think there's a couple of other institutions that do it reflexively. And we have shown uh, in, 
in, in one large study, and we are now screening almost every everyone in the state of Ohio on, on a large study, 4,000 plus patients. With colon cancer, it's the same, but we, we, we actually are able to uh, detect or uh, to detect abnormalities that may lead us to suspect Lynch syndrome. And then we do the additional testings and we can find Lynch syndrome. This is the MSI piece. Now, uh, there are other uh, genetic tests that are not needed or not necessary. Uh, 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 one, because they are not indicated, and two, because they are not applicable to the patient in terms of the familial inherited causes. So I think Lynch syndrome is probably uh, uh, the, the one uh, syndrome that is more likely to be detected just from applying these genetic testings on the tumor. So other than that, I don't think there's much for us to do other, unless you know, there's a personal history or a very strong family history that should lead us into other genetic testing, and that's a completely different story. In terms of the, you know, looking, let's say, for KRAS and BRAF and NRAS and CMET and all these other uh, 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 mutations or amplifications we've been talking about, for someone who's been cured about, from that cancer, absolutely no reason to test those. Because once you're cured from your cancer, and, and even if you're, you're you know, 80% in the first year of cure, and then after two years, you know, you're, you're 90%, etc. Unless there is evidence of the cancer coming back, there is no real need to do genetic testing on the cancer, uh, because the patient uh, that is cured from that cancer is very unlikely to ever ever need any form of these therapies. So it'd be an absolute waste of the patient's time, uh, and it would not help in any shape or form uh, change the, the therapy. So the only time you would do that type of genetic testing is when you think, and again, that takes me back to the point I was making, the only time that you do that type of genetic testing is when you think it may actually help apply a certain therapy. So for the cured patient, uh, you're not going to do that. You're not going to use an EGFR inhibitor. You're not going to use a CMET inhibitor or a MAC inhibitor or any of these other inhibitors. And therefore, it is absolutely futile to do these tests uh, in those patients. Okay, and along those lines about um, BRAF mutations, we actually have a couple of questions about KRAS and BRAF mutations that I'll try and loop into one. So for a patient whose tumor, uh, whose tumor is a, who they do have a KRAS mutation. They should not get Herbitux or Vectibix, but what about Avastin? Okay, well, that's, that's, a, that's an important question. So if you have a KRAS mutation, uh, that certainly means that, as you said, Herbitux and Vectibix should not be administered because they will not benefit the patient. However, Avastin, which targets uh, the blood vessels and other tumor, does not really care about uh, the presence or absence of KRAS mutations. As such, you know, the presence of KRAS mutation uh, should not prohibit the patient or should not stop the patient from receiving Avastin. And the patient should receive Avastin in that, you know, unless there are other contraindications, of course, uh, that have nothing to do with the genetics of the tumor. Uh, but if the patient is eligible, then they should receive Avastin, regardless of the KRAS status. Okay. Good, 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 good clarification. And so what about some, a, a stage four metastatic colorectal cancer patient who has a KRAS or a BRAF mutation? Um, out, it, what, what would you suggest for them? Uh, so if they have a KRAS mutation uh, or a BRAF mutation, so it's very important, and let me track back a little bit here, it's very important to understand that BRAF mutations do not occur at the same time than KRAS mutations. Uh, they're what we call mutually exclusive, uh, meaning you cannot be both BRAF and KRAS muta mu uh, mutated at the same time. There is one case in, in, in 10,000 that may have both, uh, but uh, the other uh, 9,999 will, uh, will not have the two mutations. Uh, so to be clear about that. Uh, for patients who have BRAF mutation, they're typically KRAS wild type. So they sh can and, and, and they should be able to receive EGFR inhibitors, such as Vectibix and Herbitux. Uh, the only thing that the BRF mutation tells us is that these may be more aggressive tumors, not that they don't benefit from EGFR inhibitors because they do. Uh, uh, so the one thing I said about the BRF 
uh, uh, mutations is that they will also help us uh, uh, select those patients out at some point for some of these BRAF inhibitors that are in clinic uh, in development in clinical research. And so if there's a trial like we have and many other institutions have with a BRAF inhibitor, uh, then it may become very relevant to test for BRAF mutations. They can receive an EGFR inhibitor and then when they need to go on the clinical trial, they will receive the BRAF inhibitor. For KRAS mutated uh, uh, cancer cells, as we said, you know, these are not eligible for EGFR inhibitors, but these could be eligible for multiple other trials, and that includes the ones with MEK inhibitors. Remember, those can receive a vast in the first line, they can receive a vast in the second line, and then after that, uh, perhaps regorafenib or a clinical trial with a MEK inhibitor, uh, or now as we have more of the CMET inhibitors being developed in clinic, then those could be screened for CMET amplification or CMET overexpression and could also be eligible for these trials. So there are a number of trials that patients with colorectal cancer may be eligible for. Okay, very good. Um, so we have a couple more questions that I'm just hoping um, to get through before we close it out for tonight. Um, there's actually somebody on the line tonight whose father passed away after the first dose of chemotherapy for colorectal cancer. And as a result, this, uh, this patient who apparently has either colon or rectal cancer as well, um, fears for chemotherapy and has decided to get radiation only. Is there some type of testing that could be done to, to help her kind of better understand the situation, him or her better understand the situation? Hmm. That's, a, that's, a, that's quite a complex uh, issue. Uh, the answer is, 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 is no. So um, there are certain uh, deficiencies in enzymes that clear 5-FU. And again, I'm talking, I don't know the case. I'm thinking that that may be the reason. Uh, because there are very few reasons for patients, very few, I mean, uh, and that'd be incredibly unusual for a patient to die from chemotherapy from the first dose. Very, very, very unusual. Um, and so mm -hmm. some of the reasons why is there is a, there's a mutation and there's a deficiency in an enzyme called DPD, the hydro, uh, pyrimidine dehydrogenase. So it's an enzyme that actually clears 5-FU, 5-fluorouracil, from the, from the bloodstream. It's present in the liver less than 1% of the overall population may be deficient in that enzyme, and some of them quite severely. And so they can get some significant toxicities uh, from the treatment and may die from the 5-FU. Uh, but that's incredibly uncommon and unusual. So other than that, unless, <clears throat> uh, unless the patient had just a violent reaction to the chemo, which is, again, incredibly unusual, uh, uh, then it's, it's very difficult uh, to pinpoint what exactly happened. There's nothing genetically, uh, uh, ge there's no genetic testing that can be done uh, today that would clear that. Again, not having a clear idea about what exactly happened. Uh, uh, you know, if it was the 5-FU, and if it was because of that suspected deficiency in DPD, then uh, there are certain solutions. One, you could be tested for it, which I actually discourage for the general population, but if that's a concern, or not sure it's even something that's inherited. Um, or the other way is to have a very, very uh, open and frank discussion with a physician to try to understand about what kind of safeguards are put today. Because today is different than 10 years ago. I mean, today or 15 years ago. Today we have many, many more safeguards. We understand much, much more about how to pre-medicate patients and keep an eye on things. And, you know, as, as you know, most of the patients actually tend to do fairly well on chemotherapy, and we have very few uh, that, that don't do too well, and we always find a way to actually adjust the situation for the overwhelming majority of the patients. So that experience may have been 10, 15 years ago when we didn't have the same tools. I would encourage that patient uh, to, to, uh, to reconsider that and, and go back and talk at length with, uh, with, uh, with, the, with the oncologist because, you know, frankly, uh, today's treatment uh, has is, and is making significant differences in our patients' lives compared to, uh, uh, let's see, uh, 2013, compared to 14, 15 years ago. Uh, I mean, 14, 15 years ago, we only had five of you that we were working with that we were trying, sometimes we give as a bolus, another time we give as an infusion, 
to try to change this. Today we have all these agents and we have all these tests that are helping us refine some of the agents' uses. And in two years, three years from now, it's going to be even much more than that. Our survival, uh, you know, survival for our patients tripled and is almost getting close to, on average, three or four years, on average, uh, you know, for patients with stage four disease, which means for some patients they can live another 10 or 20 years of their lifetime. So, so I would encourage that to actually go back to the oncologist and discuss it like this because, uh, you know, today's chemotherapy, today's refinement of treatment, today's support around the treatment is so much different than it was, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago. And a lot of the things that could have happened 10, 15 years ago are unlikely to happen today. Right. Well, that well, that's good news, and that is a, it's a difficult um, it's a difficult question to answer. So I'm going to give you two more questions, and then give you an opportunity to give us kind of two takeaways from tonight. So the second to last question is: Do you know, or can you know, based on genetic profiling of your tumor, which second round of chemotherapy might be most effective for you? Uh, so you know that 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 so that question is, is interesting in some ways because uh, in, uh, one of the biggest challenges today for us is to understand how we want to sequence our treatment. Uh, so in terms of chemotherapies, you know, for Fiery, for Fox, we know that it doesn't matter which one you start with. Um, you know, they, they seem to be mutually uh, uh, good. You start with one, then you use the other one, or you, you start with for Fox, you go to for Fiery or vice versa, you get the same result. Uh, in terms of the biologics, where this question becomes more applicable, so as I said, the overwhelming majority of the patients will receive a BAST uh, in the first line, and today still applicable because of its low uh, toxicity yield. Uh, uh, but in the presence of a KRAS wild type patient, uh, uh, so pa patients who do not have a mutation in KRAS, uh, then the second line. Uh, uh, could very well be either the continuation of Avastin, and there's data to support that, or shift to Aflibercept, or uh, in, installing an EGFR inhibitors, which in my mind is probably preferred at this point of time. Uh, so for the KRS wild type patients, uh, you could certainly make the argument that if you use Avastin in the first line, that it's very obvious that an EGFR inhibitor would, would be uh, your second line, but it's also possible to use another e uh, VEGF inhibitor before going to the EGFR inhibitor. For the KRS mutated patients, unfortunately, uh, uh, there is not uh, no EGFR inhibitors on hand, uh, so you're, you continue through the VEGF inhibitors, and therefore, you know, the only thing the test will tell you is that you, you will not receive EGFR inhibitors in the second line, or you just continue the Avastin. Uh, so I hope that clarified the question. There is today no test that actually tells you exactly what you should do in the first line and the second line, uh, but we have guides, if you will, uh, or guidelines about how we should proceed from first to second. Okay, very good. And let's. So I think this is a very interesting question. So does genetic testing, does the information you learn from genetic testing actually changed? Uh, the, the way the question reads is published data on the efficacy of drugs, and the the, the uh, participant actually expanded on that a little bit. For example, in uh, with the data that we've seen in regorafenib or Stavarga, it yields a, a 1.4 month increase in overall survival. But if appropriate genetic testing is considered, should a patient reinterpret those results to be either longer for some or less for others? Does does it actually have an impact on? on the data that's already been published? So this is, uh, this is actually an outstanding question because it's, it's, it's the dilemma that we go through. So uh, let me try to simplify this, my answer as much as possible because it's, it's actually quite a complex answer. But if you look at the curves, and I didn't show you that, but if you look at the curves uh, of the survival curves for Stivaga or Regorafenib, it is very obvious that there is a small subgroup of patients that is benefiting just tremendously, and the, the about 80% that don't seem to be pulling benefit any benefit or are not pulling a lot of benefit. So we know that there's a, there's a way for us to select those patients. What we do not know today is that how to select those patients. And you know, frankly, we go back to K, to, to EGFR inhibitors. EGFR inhibitors 
were f when when they were approved first, they were approved for all patients. We didn't know KRAS. We didn't understand KRAS. It didn't exist then. I mean, it existed in small trials. We thought maybe it's useful. And then a lot of these trials that were already published had tissue that we went and tested. And then after we tested, we looked back and we said, well, you know what? When we look at the individual patient, patients, then we see a big difference between the two groups, the mutated and the non-mutated. So the answer to this is that, yes, it, it will affect the results once we find. But, but, but the material has to come from the study itself. It cannot come from another study. Because if it comes from another study, it's very difficult to do that interpretation. But if it comes from the same study, and I know that on that correct study that looked at the rugorafenib, uh, they had tissue and they had blood, and they're analyzing a lot of this to, as we speak today. Uh, if, we, if, if we are able to find a, a, a biomarker, whether in the blood or in the tissue, so a genetic or a molecular test, that tells us who is more likely to respond, then yes, it will affect uh, the results of the published uh, data, and it will tell us at that point who should and who should not get the treatment. But that's not before another two years, perhaps. Now, if you find the same in another trial with regorafenib, it will not apply to, this, to the study that's already published uh, unless we use the material from the published study. Okay, so we've got to we've got to kind of stay tuned. Um, so, lastly, I just want to give you um, a chance to, if you could give us just two takeaways from tonight. We've talked about a lot of stuff. We talked about mutations and biomarkers and MEK inhibitors and molecular testing and genetic testing. For our attendees that are that are listening tonight, what are just like two takeaways that, from a patient's perspective or a caregiver's perspective, that that you would want um, folks to know about the topic tonight? Absolutely. So I think, again, you know, uh, the information that you, you guys help uh, provide patients with empowers, empowers them, you know, to be able to go and discuss a lot of these issues with their, with their doctors, and this is very important. So I think that two things. We're going to split this into early-stage disease and metastatic colon cancer. For the early-stage disease, I think this is where the patients need to understand uh, the importance of asking the questions. One, I think there are, there are multiple questions, but the most important questions are, one, are there any tests, genetic tests out there that actually would help you, the physician, and me, the patient, understand whether we, uh, uh, there is a treatment that will make a difference for, for, uh, for my cancer or not? Uh, and two, I think the other important point is uh, also to ask about uh, the likelihood of having a genetic or familial uh, syndrome that led to this colon cancer and whether any tests were done like MSI or others, which raises uh, the possibility for Lynch, Lynch syndrome and other syndromes. I think these are very important discussions. Sometimes, believe it or not, they are overlooked. Uh, you know, busy clinician or, you know, there's, there's these things were not done. I think this is where the patient needs to be involved uh, with their physicians in making sure that a lot of these things happen. For the metastatic setting, again, it's very, very important uh, uh, to, sh to plan the treatment. Remember, patients are going to be on treatment for most of their lifetime, and that lifetime can be years and years with metastatic cancer, and patients will see multiple different agents and multiple lines of therapy. And so it's very important to have a good plan from day one. Uh, and they want meaning that well, the first time the patient meets with the doctor, with the physician, they need to have that discussion about what genetic testing are you going to do on my tumor uh, or you suggest I do. And if the, if the patient has ideas, you know, because all of us, we go and Google, we look at things, we learn from other patients, uh, you know, ask the, the physician about the value of this and that testing. Should, should, I think everyone should have that tumor tested for KRAS from hello, from the hello, from the first time they get that biopsy. They should have the KRAS testing, and I would start arguing that they should get what we call all RAS mutation tested, meaning NRAS and KRAS, not just KRAS, uh, and not just codon 12 and 13, but a lot of others. And that will help us refine further the treatment. And the other thing is, of course, ask about the value of testing for other mutations like BRAF if there are in the region any trials that may have BRAF inhibitors available. Uh, and I think it's very important also to ask the physicians always about the availability of other clinical trials 
in the area when they that they may apply to some of the mutations uh, that have been tested on the tumor. So I think the take take home message here is for the patient to be involved in making sure that uh, the tumors are profiled, tested as they should, and most importantly, understand the value of the test to the patient and the value of the test in terms of what kind of care and what kind of agent they're going to allow the patient to be exposed to. Well, that's terrific. Really, really excellent, um, really excellent advice. And we, um, Dr. Bakaisal, we really appreciate your time. Fight Colorectal Cancer uh, really um, values the expertise that we're able to provide to our constituents via um, um, professionals such as yourself. So I want to thank you um, for your time tonight. If anybody has any further questions, they can always contact us here at Fight Colorectal Cancer at the um, answer line or the email that's listed there on the slide. Um, and to all of our attendees tonight, we really appreciate your your attendance. And obviously, it's a very important topic that that is in the process of developing. So we will all stay tuned. And um, again, thank you so much for your time tonight, Dr. Bakaisov and all of our IT people on the line and all of our attendees too. Everybody have a great night and wherever you are, try and stay cool. <laughs> thank you all for your attendance. Bye-bye.